There may not be a singular book of Joseph, but the largest narrative of Genesis covers Joseph in the book. This tells us that such an account carries great significance and as such is worth a special observance. Within Genesis chapters 37 to 50, we will discover the patterns of God's work through his providence and his promises for his people, all of which are interwoven through human fallenness, failures, and betrayal, which means this, what man meant for evil, God meant for good. This is the picture and power of the gospel. Throughout the account, Joseph may be the central figure, but his family, especially Judah, draws a prophetic line to the coming Messiah. You see, through Joseph in the book, God is reversing the curse and revealing the blessing. And that is why in Joseph's life, we see a type of Christ, betrayed by his own family, only to one day be in the very position to save many. So as we trace the life of Joseph from a low pit to the high palace, let us learn the lessons and know the blessings of steady obedience to God's promises, regardless of our circumstances. This is Joseph in the book, evil recycled for good. All right, good morning again, church. My name's Matthew Mayer, one of the pastors honored to serve in this space right here with the administration of God's word. If you've been with us for some time now, you know we are looking at the narrative or the life of Joseph specifically. And as you just heard in what we call the sermon bumper, that overview, there's a greater theme that is unfolding before our eyes as we look at God's providence as he's able to even take what would be seemingly evil, right, oppressive wrongs, pains, and sufferings and recycle them and bring good for his people and his ultimate glory. Now, I have no idea how many messages we've done so far with the life of Joseph. There are plenty to choose from, starting in Genesis chapter 37. If you haven't been with us, you can likely begin there and take your time as we walk and talk our way through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Of course, what looks like the main character, Joseph, as he's been betrayed by his own family as a youth, 17 years of age, eventually sold as a slave by his very own brothers, 10 of them, there's 12 that make up the family of Jacob. The Bible gives Jacob's name Israel. They would eventually become the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. So 10 of them, minus Joseph and his youngest brother, Benjamin. And we're gonna see Benjamin's name show up in Genesis chapter 42 today. But they sell him as a slave, and that's where kind of the backwards effect of God's providence begins. You have to go backwards sometimes before you get shot forward, right? And I know we don't like going backwards. Of course, we do not like the pains and the sufferings that come with the trials of this world. Nonetheless, God is faithful. God is sovereign. We believe here at this church God is sovereign over the biggest happenings and even the smallest happenings. He is faithful to fulfill his word. As a slave, of course, Joseph was faithful to serve, stewarding well what God had entrusted to him, right? I said he stewarded well where he was. He, of course, suffered successfully through it all. God was with him because he chose to be with God. And then by the end of chapter 39, Joseph, of course, is falsely accused of sexual assault. By who? His master's wife. So he goes from being a slave in Potiphar's house to being a prisoner in Pharaoh's prison. And you gotta stop and go, man, this guy cannot catch a break. But when we see it from our physical eyes, right, we gotta, we gotta say like, man, it, terrible what's happening to Joseph. But if we see it from spiritual eyes, if we see it from God's economy, God has Joseph exactly where he needs him. Remember, one of those lessons, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go through a single Sunday without reminding you, God leads us where he needs us, where he needs us. Right, and you do not have to choose those circumstances in order for God to use those circumstances. He's faithful as an inmate of the state. Of course, you almost see the cycle of Joseph's faithfulness and God's favor upon him by the end of chapter 39. What happens, the warden entrusts to Joseph his peers, the other inmates in the jail. 
Two of them were introduced to in chapter 40. It would be other officers of Pharaoh, the butler and the baker. And what happens is they have these dreams and they're troubled. And I love them. One lesson that we discovered during that study was that Joseph paid attention to those around him. And I said the one, of, one of the quickest ways to diminish your own sorrows is to begin focusing on others. Of course, Joseph could have focused on his troubles, but he had the wherewithal, the spiritual sensitivity even, to notice that, hey guys, your countenance has fallen, what is up? The question leads to the answer. We've had dreams, we're troubled by them. Of course, Joseph is used by God to interpret their dreams. In three days, baker, off with your head. In three days, butler, you will be restored. But remember me when that happens. When it goes well for you, remember me. Joseph's hope rises. Of course, at the end of those three days, just as he said, that's what happened. Butler restored, baker executed. The start of Genesis chapter 41 tells us two years had passed, two full years. Remember, God has Joseph exactly where he needs him because what's gonna unfold in Genesis chapter 41 was the highest man in the land, one who thought himself a god. The Pharaoh himself would be troubled by two dreams. And that amnesia <laughs> that the butler had came back. I know somebody who can interpret dreams, he says to the Pharaoh. And in a day, right, so last Sunday we covered Joseph being elevated or promoted in a singular day was not an overnight success story. It was 13 years in the making. And what God was doing in Joseph's young life from 17 to 30 was testing him, right? That's a biblical word that means proving him. That is a word that in metallurgy is refining him. Now, the best commentary on the Bible is, of course, the Bible. So we're gonna look at Psalm 105, verses 16 to 22, which is the commentary of what was occurring from God's perspective in the life of Joseph and in the life of of Israel as a people. It begins in Psalm 105 with a declaration of thanksgiving to the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. And now I'm gonna jump to verse 16, but before I do that, please understand this. When we come together on a Sunday or on a Thursday or sub-ministries, one of the reasons we do so is to proclaim the praises of our God. We are to declare the marvelous works of God. One of the reasons we tell testimonials is because we are declaring that God is good through whatever we've been through. God has been faithful through circumstances that seem faithless. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, so we hear from you. Many of you are recipients of the blessings that flow through this fellowship. Whether it's a ministry come alongside of you, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a volunteer at the door, whether it's lost and found ministry serving on the streets in Atlantic City. Do you understand when we bring that to your attention, it's to declare the marvelous works of God in this body. Amen. All right. Just as Norm got that same applause, we are excited to be here on a Sunday. Verse 16. Moreover, he, this is God, called for a famine in the land. Note that. He destroyed all the provision of bread, who? God. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave, everything we just got done covering. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons, verse 19, until the time that his word came to pass. Whose word? Joseph's dreams. Until the time they would be fulfilled. Guess when they're going to be fulfilled? In Genesis 42 today. What was occurring? The word of the Lord tested him. Tested who? Joseph. The word of the Lord was testing Joseph. From the moment that his brothers turned on him to the moment he ended up as a slave in Egypt to the way he served in Potiphar's house, the word 
of the Lord was testing him. Trying him would be another way to say it. Examining him. Right, when we're told to examine ourselves to see whether or not we're in the faith, that's a command to place your life along the line of scripture to test where your faith lies. Now, I'll say this up front before I continue reading. Primarily, there are two ways God will test your faith or develop your character, because they're one and the same. The testing of the faith, whether or not you trust God for the outcome, regardless of what your life looks like, come by two means. The first, God will test your faith or develop your character through the teaching of the word. That's your classroom session, the teaching of the word. That's corporate and that's personal and private, right? Do not let me do your studying for you. So the teaching of the word is one of the ways God tests your faith. And then, here's the clinical. After the classroom comes, the clinical, the trials of this world. It's like God wants to see what you know. He knows what you know, but do you know what you know? So then it's the trials or the troubles of the world, right? Because in the world you are gonna have <laughs> trouble, tribulation, trial. And God is testing our faith. And I, don't, I know we don't like it that way, but there's something within us that he's trying to expose, right? A lot of it is selfishness. It's these things that keep us away from God and God is bringing them to the surface, right? Because he's testing and it's the dross that has to come off of the metal for it to be purified and refined. Let's continue, verse 20. The king sent and released him. This is Pharaoh releasing Joseph. The ruler of the people let him go free. Joseph, he made him lord of his house. There's the promotion. By the way, there is no promotion without heaven's permission. There's no elevation, there's no promotion without heaven's permission. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions. Did you know that? Joseph was lord over everything except for Pharaoh's throne. To I never really caught this, verse 22. To bind his princes at his pleasure. What type of authority did Joseph have? As the governor and the prime minister, it tells us to bind even the princes at his will and teach his elders wisdom. That's all connected to the ministry of Joseph in Egypt. He was teaching the elders wisdom. All right, pause, pivot. There's our commentary, biblical commentary on the life of Joseph and the purpose that God was accomplishing in light of and in spite of, okay? So what's it got to do with us? Well, everything. Because even our faith is being tested by the word of the Lord. Because faith that is not tested, cannot be trusted. And there are some things in your life that the Lord is testing and refining and examining because he wants to develop your character and your heart and your faith so that one day our faith would not be dependent upon our feelings or even what we see with our naked eye, right? That's why the Bible declares we walk by what? Not by what? Sight. We walk by obedience. That can be another way to say we walk by what? Obedience to the word of God, which you can see. And if you can see God's word, teaching of his word, you're gonna need to know he is faithful when you get out in that world and the world presents you trials, right? So here's the classroom before the clinical. Now remember, when we ended last Sunday, at the end of Genesis 41, Joseph was given a wife by Potiphera, not to be mistaken with Potiphar, but I thought the connection was showing us that there was a false accusal in the house of Potiphar by his wife, and then we're seeing a reversal of that false accusal by another Potiphar who is given his daughter as a wife. I just think it's remarkable because God is restoring to Joseph perhaps the years that were lost, the years that were eaten by the locusts. So what does he do? He has two children. In the span of the seven years, 
of prosperity and plenty, he has two children. He names them Manasseh, Manasseh, or Ephraim, or some say Ephraim, Ephraim. Manasseh and Ephraim in the proper pronunciation of those words. And their names declare Joseph's testimony. I love it. Manasseh, his name means forgetfulness. But Joseph adds a qualifier. God has caused me to forget the trials, the toil, the trouble of my past, of my father's house. He was not saying he's completely forgetting his heritage. And here's how we know that. He would not have named his children Hebrew names if he was trying to erase his Hebrew heritage. Does that make sense? What is he forgetting? He's forgetting the bitterness of those trials. He's forgetting what could have caused him to be resentful in those trials. He's choosing to forget the negativity that it caused him. So then he names his second son a reflection of what God had done. Ephraim, which means this. God has made me fruitful, forgetful of the affliction to be fruitful in the affliction. God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Can you say that as your testimony this morning? Can you declare the marvelous works of God that he has made you fruitful in the land of your affliction? And I know it sounds like a contradiction, but the psalmist helps us. He says, it is good for me that I've been afflicted. Wait, what? Good and affliction in the same sentence? That doesn't add up. No, from our human physical sense, it doesn't make sense. But God uses affliction to draw us back to his word. Why? Because he's testing and he's refining and he's purifying. Do you have a testimony? Some of you are in the midst of God writing your testimony, and it hurts. But I guarantee you, one day there will be somebody that needs to hear your testimony about God's faithfulness, because they're gonna be where you're at right now, and they're gonna be suffocating, and they're not gonna see an end in sight, but they're gonna need your testimony from experience that you, guys, that you actually believe God is good when circumstances aren't good. The church needs a testimony about God's faithfulness in these very unfaithful days. Not a telemony, there's a big difference, and I didn't say alimony, some of you know what that means by experience. I'm talking about a testimony. A telemony is somebody that's like telling it, but they don't really believe it. And you know they don't believe it because when the rubber of faith touches the road, the wheels come off. So they didn't really believe what they said they believed. And you know who knew that? God. He's constantly drawing out of us more faith. This is where we're at in Genesis chapter 42, beginning where we left off, verses one through four. Camera pans. Now we're back in Canaan. When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, Indeed, I have heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there, that we may live and not die. Now, mind you, we can probably put this on the timeline approximately 20 plus years post Genesis 37. 20 plus years. Now, here's the math. Joseph 17 in Genesis 37. Jo Joseph 30 in Genesis 41, that's 13 years. By the end of Genesis 41, we are told the seven years of plenty have passed. 13 plus seven, that's 20 years. Now, however long it took for the beginning of the seven years of famine, however long it took for the famine and the condition throughout the land to affect Jacob's house, how long, a couple months, maybe a year, He's beginning to feel the lack of provision. Wealthy man as he was, the Bible tells us that about Jacob. He's now sensing that they need to do something unless, ready, we die. There was perhaps talk in the community that there is grain in Egypt. By the way, Egypt would have been at least a couple week journey from Canaan by the way they would have traveled. So it was a big deal that grain was offered in 
Egypt. Notice this, before we even read on, Jacob hears about the grain in Egypt and he makes an observation about his boys. He says to them, why do you look at one another? Now there had to have been a conversation that they overheard before he asked them, what are you guys staring at? You're staring blankly at each other. Could it have been? The moment they heard the word Egypt, the last time that they had any concern for Egypt was 20 plus years earlier where they were sending their youngest brother, selling him as a slave. You know what I'm talking about? The conscience sometimes presents a countenance that you're unaware of. You know what I'm talking about? You know that weekend after that weekend and your mom and dad come home like, did you hear what happened to our neighbor? And all the, the brothers are in the room. Somebody paintballed the house down the street and they're all looking at each other. Nobody had that experience? Is that just my household? <laughs> like there was no accusation that you guys were the ones that paintballed the house, but there was something in us where we're looking at each other like, oh boy. That's kind of what's understood here. They're staring at each other. There's something going on within them. They're astonished. They're dumbfounded. They're staring at one another. There's guilt from their past that has just arrived to the surface. Jacob's like, stop staring at each other. There is grain in Egypt to get, lest we die. Now watch what happens in Jacob's heart. Right, so we just got a picture of what's happening in the brothers' hearts. So Joseph's 10 brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers. For he said, here it is, lest some calamity befall him. Now, what's going on in the brother's heart? There's guilt from their past. 20 years earlier, something they had done and covered up and lied about is now perhaps coming to the surface of their conscience. No doubt they've suppressed it over this time. The buzzword of Egypt causes them to look at each other. They don't probably think Joseph is still alive, but the fact that they're going to Egypt perhaps caused them some perplexity. But Jacob, he's not sending Benjamin. Now, please know this. When Joseph was 17, Benjamin was likely one or two. He was a baby, a toddler. All these years have passed. He's at least 20-something now. Joseph was 17 when his dad sent him on a long journey to check up on his brothers. There's something here, and the Bible goes out of the way to tell us he didn't want to send Benjamin, lest a calamity befall him. Now remember, Joseph and Benjamin are brothers by blood. Their mother was Rachel. Jacob loved Rachel, tolerated his other three wives. The two sons of Rachel that were his beloved were Joseph that's why Joseph got that coat of many colors. Is all this making sense? It's why the brothers hated Joseph because dad neglected them and gave everything to Joseph. This was the beginning of the unraveling that God was in the midst of and the, the God in heaven was allowing because he was going to bring something out of it. Okay, Benjamin probably even had a more intimate connection with his father. When Benjamin was born, that is when Rachel died. She died giving birth to, as they named him, Benoni. Benoni, that name means son of suffering, right? Of course, she dies, here's a son, son of suffering. Jacob changed his name to Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. And in the name change is the gospel itself, that first Christ would come as the son of the suffering one, and he would be elevated to sit at the right hand of the father. It's just an awesome embedded picture of the gospel, but Jacob is holding Benjamin close. Now think about that. What are you holding close? What are you gripping so much so that you've not yet entrusted to God? Is it your marriage? Is it your family? Is it your children? Is it your finances? Is it your occupation? So if something's happening in the brother's heart, guilt from the past, something's happening in Jacob's heart, fear in the present, he doesn't wanna lose something, what I wanna say to us is that regardless of what's happening in the past, the guilt therein, regardless of what's happening in the present, the fear thereof, God's grace is never absent. Whether guilt of the past, like the brothers, whether fear in the present, like Jacob, God's grace is never absent. Remember, they're going to Egypt with a guilty conscience. They have no idea God is going to meet them there 
and their brother is not dead. In fact, he's the savior of the land. And Jacob is saying to himself, I can't lose another son. I've already lost one. And he has no idea that God is at work behind the scenes and his son that he thinks is dead is actually alive. God's grace is always working whether or not you think it is. God's grace will sanitize any shame from the past. If you let God's grace sanitize the shame of your past, where you no longer have regrets. Regrets are not good. Remorse is good. Remorse, good. Remorse and guilt, good, when it rolls over to grace. Regret and shame, not good. It takes you away from grace. God's grace is also able to sterilize fear. Fear leads to a doubt. Fear leads to shutting down. And if you trust God to be good, he's able to sterilize that fear. God's providence is never inactive. As this unfolds, watch what happens. Verse five. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed. Now, mind you, look at that. Something I never call it. It's a community affair. The whole community is sending their choice individuals to go get grain from Egypt. So they're traveling in a caravan like Joseph once traveled in a caravan on their way to Egypt. For the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land. There his title is, prime minister. It was he who sold to the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Can you see this? Ten older brothers bowing down as a sign of respect and reverence to a foreign leader, an Egyptian leader, who has the ability to either give them the grain that will cause the family to survive or withhold from them. So this is out of respect and fear. Now, this is remarkable because what we just read is the fulfillment of Joseph's first dream. Yeah. Remember the first dream he had as a 17-year-old? Guys, he got a dream. And what was the dream involving? His sheaf standing upright when the brother's sheaves, sheaves, grain, <laughs> were bowing down to him. And what spurred them on with such anger was the dreamer. And one day, when they see the dreamer coming from afar, they said... Let's kill the dreamer. So the dream shared with them became the catalyst for them to try to kill him to kill the dream. But you can't kill what God said. You can't stop God's word. Regardless of the enemy or even your own lack of faith, God's word is going to be accomplished. It's remarkable to me to see they're bowing in the very place where they sent him. When they were told this is what they would do, the dream, that prompted them and led them to do what they would do, which was kill the dreamer. Can I put this together in one sentence for you? Their malice is what brought Joseph to the palace. Was that like a little elf clapping or? <laughs> Their malice brought Joseph to the palace. Their hate for him because of the dream he explained to them. Shall we bow to you and you have authority over us? Became the very catalyst that would eventually bring the dream to its fulfillment. You know, we quote Romans 8, 28. We all know that, right? We know all things work together for good. True, right? God is working all things. We often quote some Psalms and even a prophecy from Isaiah about God knows the end from the beginning, right? We often quote Genesis 50, which we'll get there. Verse 20, you meant evil, God meant good. There's this Psalm, chapter 76, verse 10, that says it like this. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The psalmist is declaring that even the wrath of man is one day gonna praise God. What, is he, what do you mean by, he's saying there's nothing that can happen in the course of human history that is not going to one day give God full glory. I, I hope that's a comfort to someone in here, right? Because there's been some really crappy things that have happened to you. 
Some real bitter cards have been dealt your way. But if you can just get out of your own way for a second, right? And trust that God has a purpose even in some of the harder things of life, you will discover this one truth, that the will of God does not violate the will of man, that's true, but at the same time, the will of man is not isolated from the will of God, right? So the brothers are responsible for their actions, as all of us are. God's will does not negate the responsibilities and the consequences of our decisions. No, God is just working in the midst of those decisions. Now, Theology 101, if this was a lecture, I'd present it to you like this, that there is the preferred will of God. God has a preferred will, and you can define his preferred will by either right or wrong. He wants you to go right. His preferred will is to do what is righteous in his sight, right? I prefer you, God says, that you choose what is right, but he knows, according to his permissive will, that we have a choice to either go right or go left. I prefer you to go right, but I've permitted you, permissive will of God, free will, as we say it theologically, to go left. Left comes with consequences. Left comes with more pain and more shame and more regret. But here's the providential will. Prefer you to go right, permitted you to go left, but I'm gonna use what's left to bring about what's right. That's God's providential will. God is going to use what's left to bring about what's right. That's the sub-theme of this entire study. God is able to recycle evil for good. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, verse seven and eight, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. All right, pretty amazing verses considering this is the first time Joseph sees his brothers in over 20 years. And he, please note this, he acted. A lot of Bible commentators suggest that he's being vindictive in the way he's about to handle them. No, the text does not lend itself to that conclusion. It tells us he acted as a stranger to them. He is hiding his true identity. Now, if we trust that the Spirit of God is moving and guiding Joseph, according to Pharaoh's own mouth, I've never met anyone as discerning and wise as you. The Spirit of God is in you. Here, we have to understand there was this moment where he recognizes them. They don't recognize him simply because he looks Egyptian, he talks Egyptian, and it's been 20 years of being weathered by life for all of them. He disguises himself. He acts roughly towards them. Now, here's the irony, and the irony happens over and over in these types of accounts, like Esther's narrative, similarly Joseph's narrative. Remember, the last time they saw Joseph, they were throwing him into a pit to starve as they ate their lunch. Do you remember that? He's in the pit, and it tells us they're eating their food. Now they're on the verge of starving, they are, and they're actually coming to Joseph for some lunch. <laughs> I, I just like, I'm like, oh my goodness, the, the way the Lord is just kind of showing us the reversal is occurring. He speaks roughly to them. He asks them, where do they come from? They answer from the land of Canaan, verse nine. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, he continues, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land, the land's vulnerability in the midst of the famine. You've come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my Lord. Now, I don't know if they're still on their knees. Have they been commanded to rise? No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons, true. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies, true. But he said to them, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are 12 brothers. Notice he, he's pressing. Joseph is testing. And, and actually, the Bible's gonna tell us he's testing. They say, no, we are servants. Your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today. True. And one is no more. Ouch. 
right? Can we stop and put ourselves in Joseph's shoes? Can you imagine like the whiplash? The line of people from Canaan are coming into the court. Joseph is the one that is administering the grain. And then he notices familiar faces, his brothers. And the last time that he had seen them, they were pinning him down. And they were negotiating a price for his life to send him away forever. Can you imagine how quickly this is occurring? Does it make sense now why Joseph is disguising himself? Perhaps he has, he has not had the time to pray and strategize, but at least he is preventing them from seeing him. He knows he looks different, and it's gonna tell us later on, in a couple verses, that he has a translator. So he's not speaking to them in Hebrew, he's likely speaking to them in Egyptian, and a translator is communicating that. So there's this go-between. Does this make sense? Who are you? You're spies. No, we're not. He's pressing. He wants to know how his family's doing. He wants to hear about his father and his brother Benjamin. That's why he's pressing here. It's remarkable. And their estimation of themselves, right? We are honest men. Now, that's up for debate. Honest men based on what standard? So far, they were pretty honest, right? We are brothers, they're 12, dad's home, one is no more, they don't say whether he's dead, or whether they, they don't admit that they're the reason why he's no more, but again, one of these things struck me, they are saying one is no more to the one who is now more than they know. I love it, right? Like, they're saying one is no more to the very one who has become way more than they know. Ah, oh. but let's talk for a second about their self-estimation. Because this is a general rule of the world that most of us would say, especially those not part of the household of faith, I'm honest, I'm a, I'm a good guy. What's standard? Usually the standard is, is self, right? Now when we rewind the tape, the Bible actually helps us understand what we're made of. The Bible says that we're all sinners, we're born into sin as sinful creatures, sinful, like sinful nature. From, from the newborn babies in this place and moms and dads, you already know what I'm talking about. You better believe. Mark, you better believe, man, if your son was able to hold his own head up, he'd rip your head off, <laughs> right? Like little babies, you ever hear their guttural cry and they just want a bottle of milk or they just want mom's breast or they just want, but they can't move. If they had the strength of a man, we'd all be in trouble because they're little savages bundled up and all that happens as they get older, and we know this because many of us are sitting in the sophisticated state of our sinfulness. Like, we just become more sophisticated sinners. You know how I know that? I can hear Willow and Zeke arguing in another room. Like, what are they arguing about? And then all of a sudden, one, it could be either or on any given day, begins bursting out in tears and crying. And they run to us, and you discover, of course, there's evidence of the crime scene, there's teeth marks on the arm because the other one decided to bite the other one. And I can tell you this, guys, that is not a learned behavior. They're not watching mommy and daddy in the midst of an argument bite each other. Where does that come from? It comes from the savage nature of sin. that must be eradicated, and that sin nature must be paralyzed, right? Well, how is that possible? Only by the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, it's easy to think you are true when the standard is you, but this is the truth. All men are but false when the standard is the cross. All men, the playing field is leveled at the cross of Jesus Christ. No matter who you are, no matter what you claim, at the cross, all are but sinners, right? Romans chapter six, verses five and six says it like this. For we have been united together in the likeness of his death, the cross. Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this. Now here's what the gospel implies. That our old man was crucified with him at the cross. That the body of sin, the body, my sinful body, my faculties, my members are sinful, ready? that the body of sin might be done away with. Greek, paralyzed. 
that my body of sin would be rendered inactive, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And only the Holy Spirit can accomplish that in your life. Do you get that? Only the word of God activated in your life, materialized in your life, fleshed out in your life can crucify the flesh and the carnal and the sinful nature. Interestingly, these guys, they're not there yet. They're saying, we're honest men. Meanwhile, their standard is themselves. If they were being measured by the standard of truth, we would say, no, they're not honest men. You're actually deceivers and liars. And you went home some 20 plus years earlier and deceived your father. And that is why your conscience jumped when you heard about coming to Egypt. But they have no idea that they're standing before the very one they committed the crime against. But Joseph said to them, he's pressing, it is as I spoke to you, saying, you are spies. In this manner you shall be tested. Same word, scrutinized, tried, proved, examined. By the life of Pharaoh, that is a legal statement. You shall not leave this place unless your younger brother comes here. You said you have a younger brother? Go get him. Go get him. Send one of you, one of the ten, and let him bring your brother, and you, the nine, shall be kept in prison, that your words may be, here it is again, what's it say? Tested, to see whether there is any truth in you. Now, this is Joseph, human interaction with his brothers. They don't know it's him, obviously, but guys, this is exactly what Jesus does with us. He tests us. Right? Not, not tempt, God does not tempt, but there is a testing. And he did it with the storms that he sent the disciples into. Why did he send the disciples into storms? <laughs> to test them, because that was their classroom and their clinical coming into play. And when they failed the test, he said, oh, you of little, why did you doubt? Jesus is always testing us. Joseph is saying to them, I'll keep all of you, one of you go home and get your youngest brother, verse 17, so he put them all together in prison three days. All right, this is a long weekend for them. In a jail cell, right, in the roundhouse, three days. Anybody, raise your hand if you've ever spent a few days in the county jail. Ah, nobody wants to be honest up in here. Ah, security, did you see all those hands go up? Put them in confinement for three days. Joseph knows, as God allows, it's in confining circumstances for all of us, which become defining circumstances. In other words, if you have been in a confining circumstance, right, I'm not just talking about physical incarceration. I'm speaking about a circumstance that touches your life that's squeezing, that's oppressive, it's confined you, it's isolated you. It's in, listen to me, it's in the midst of that where God is defining and refining. He wants to show you. He's not trying to make you or break you, he's trying to expose you, right? You can't be mad at the surgeon for the incision. When you come out of surgery, it's painful. But to be mad at the surgeon who cut you and opened you to heal you is what we do when we turn against God when he's allowed something to isolate us. And what he's after is the defining of our faith. Can anybody testify that you are not where you used to be, that your faith has grown, and the faith in you that was drawn out of you had to go through some trials because there was some dross on your faith, and God wants to bring out the purest faith because the world needs to see that what you say you believe, you actually believe. How about... We're gonna work on our applauses around here. <laughs> you know, the world was thrusted into a confining circumstance three years ago. In fact, we're coming up on an anniversary. I'm excited to celebrate it with you on March 16th. We'll be celebrating three years of 15 days to flatten the curve. Yeah, that worked. But the world was thrusted into a confining circumstance. Why? Because God was exposing all of us. Right? He, wanted to, he wanted to show us, all of us, humanity, where our loyalties lied. This church just went through a confining circumstance, and it has become a defining circumstance. 
It has showed all of us where our hearts and our loyalties lie. Not with a man, but with God on high. God is not trying to make us or break us. He is trying to reveal us. And when we come to him with total vulnerability and openness, and we let him do the surgery, this is where faith begins to develop. This is where hope begins to rise. Watch this. Joseph, during the three days that they're in confining quarters, what was those conversations like? Like, use your imagination. It's not, there's no, actually, we're gonna get a chapter and verse for what they were talking about. But for three days, what do you think they're saying? How crazy would it have been for them to be in a holding cell with a foreign Egyptian leader who is calling them spies? What are they talking about in the midst of those three days? I imagine Joseph in his private quarters is praying. What is he to do next? When he goes back to them after three days, what is he to do? Well, here's what the Lord lays on his heart. Watch this. Then Joseph said to them the third day, do this and live for I fear God. Don't miss this. He just made mention in his Egyptian language that he fears the Hebrew God Elohim. He does not say, do this and live for I fear the gods. Remember, the Egyptian culture was one that feared the gods, plural. He makes mention of the God of their father, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, Elohim. This should have clued them in that this leader fears their God. This is remarkable. He says, taking their words, and applying them to them. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to the prison house, but you go carry grain for the famine of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. In three days, Joseph changed his strategy, right? Before it was you're all locked up, one go. Now it's all go, one stay. He's testing. He wants to see what they'll do. He wants to see if they'll just so easily give up on Benjamin and the one that would stay, because that's what they did to him. And they did so, and they said to one another, here we go, here is probably some of the conversation talking points from the previous three days, squeezed out of them, you ready? We are truly guilty concerning our brother. Wait, what? Their mind just went back to an incident that took place 20 plus years. They are somehow making a connection of the fact that they're in dire straits in this moment with something they did to their brother, which was ancient history. Does this make sense? Now, they're right, but they're wrong. Right? They're right in assuming that God sees what they've done, but they're wrong in applying it to the circumstance, because they don't know it's Joseph. It was Joseph revealing himself. That's a statement they should have made, right? Oh my goodness, Joseph is gonna deal with us according to what we did to him. We heard him, ready? We heard the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. The screams of Joseph's soul in that moment took 20 years to touch their conscience because the three days of confining circumstances seem to have been defining circumstances. And what was within them is now being squeezed out of them and they are making a connection, wrong as it may be, that God was judging them. God was not judging them, right? But at least there's a glimmer of remorse and that is because the gravity of the consequences has finally produced guilt in their consciences. Oh, we're making progress, are we not? We're making progress with these brothers, and the word through Joseph is testing them. Now Reuben adds a little bit more color commentary. If you recall, Reuben was the oldest brother who sought to interrupt and intercept their plan to kill Joseph. Successful as he was, he's the brother that went away, and while he was away is when they sold him based on Judah, Judah saying, let's sell him as a slave. He comes back and he realizes Joseph's gone. Here's what he said to them then, and he's saying it to them again. And Reuben answered them saying, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. 
Remember, they didn't have the Bible, guys. They didn't have the law of Moses yet, where blood becomes written as sacred. They had oral tradition. And what they were pulling from is Cain and Abel, right? They're, they're distant forefathers. That Cain, you know, great uncle Cain killed great uncle Abel, and they were told orally that Abel's blood <laughs> cried out from the ground. And then God said to the humanity at the time, no one shed Cain's blood, because if you shed his blood, your blood will be shed. So they're making this connection, theological as it is, that God is, look at me, judging them. And yes, all of us one day will have to stand to account for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You will have to stand to account unless, unless you claim that same blood that you shed and I shed as the blood that covers your sin. That's how you get out of the punishment that everyone will have over their head. Now, here's what they're essentially saying, and I'm almost done. The brothers make a statement, this is happening to us, this distress, because of what we did to Joey, right? Reuben's like, I told y'all in the moment, if you do this, it's gonna come back to us. Now, the principle that is applicable for the believer is sowing and reaping, okay? What you sow, you grow. You sow, you grow. Consequences come, whether good or bad, based on that. But there's this lie, and a lot of world religions are based on this lie. And the lie is God is out to get me. You know, there's some things in my past that I've done, and the, the reason why something's happening in my family, or in my marriage, or with my kids, there's a reason why somebody's sick, is because you know God is judging me for what I did. No, no, and no. That is a lie. That's karma. Karma says you get what you deserve. But the cross says the complete opposite, that Christ got what you deserve. Hallelujah. Listen, it's, it's worth tapping into for one last second because in their mind, in their mind, they are being judged. But what's really happening is they're being set up to be saved. Oh, how so often we misunderstand what God is up to. Now watch what happens as Joseph is, he's leading them, bringing them to repentance. But they did not know that Joseph understood them for he spoke to them through the interpreter. Joseph hears this entire dialogue and he turned himself away from them and wept. Can you picture this? Now we know that his heart is vibrant and alive because it's not callous, it's not hard. He has not dealt with them from a vengeful bone in his body. He is not enacting wrath on them. He is not saying, you did this to me, I'm your brother and I'm gonna pay you back. No, but, but he's hearing them actually bring up his name and come to a place where they're actually remorseful. This is what he heard. And he turns away and he weeps. And we don't know how long he weeps, but he returns to them to talk with them. And then it says literally, Note this, he, who's the he? Joseph took Simeon. The ruler comes, he doesn't command a guard. He takes Simeon with his own hands and binds him or bound him before their eyes. This would be the last thing they would see. The last thing that he saw them do to him was binding him. The last thing he wants them to see due to Simeon is binding him, but he's not doing it out of vengeance. No, this is another example in the story of Joseph where his heart is on display. We don't see it that way, but we know the outcome. This is a merciful act on behalf of the family of Jacob, right? Remember, Joseph was the recipient of much mercy, and those who know mercy show mercy. See, the mercy shown here is in direct proportion to the mercy known. Joseph knows mercy, and he's actually showing mercy. And I wanted to end with this. One, it's a cliffhanger. They just took Simeon, and you will probably come back to hear the rest of the chapter. But two, they don't recognize that what is happening as they travel home, do you think they were saying, we cannot believe that, that Egyptian ruler showed us mercy? Oh, no. This was not mercy in their eyes. And yet, how many times has God allowed a circumstance to touch your life that you thought he was trying to hurt you or harm you, and what he was trying to do was heal you and help you. In fact, the circumstances that brought you to Christ, you looked at them as something that was hurtful, and it became the very catalyst that brought you to salvation in Christ. 
that's God's mercy. I look at my past and I go, wow, what I did by the justice system, meeting out punishment, was actually God's mercy to salvage my life. So what do we learn? We learn that faith that is not tested cannot be trusted, whether guilt of the past or fear in the present, God's grace is never absent. Of course, confining circumstances have a way of squeezing life out of us and they become defining circumstances. God is always refining our faith. He wants us to trust him even if we can't see what he's up to. Let us be those that show mercy because we are those that know mercy. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it by God's grace this morning. Let's do it. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your word declared. Thank you for the marvelous works that we can share with this community, how you've taken care of this body. You've tended to, even through the hurts and the bruises and the pain, you've been so faithful. So thank you that we can learn from the life of Joseph and, and even the brothers as we're being brought to repentance, whether it's things in the past, whether it's a fear in the present, your grace is never absent, your grace is always active, your providence is always at work. So God calls us to trust you for the outcomes. Bless your people here as we sing and praise you one last time in the name of Jesus until we return according to your will, amen.